Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Avenel. I'm the uh, director of the Japan Institute here at the ANU. And uh, on behalf of the Australia-Japan Research Center, the Japan Institute, and our generous sponsors, the Australia-Japan Foundation, I would like to welcome you to the Japan Update 2014. <coughs> our theme this year is political, economic, and social change in Japan. As a part of our Reconciliation Action Plan, we at the ANU begin all public events with an important acknowledgement of traditional owners, uh, which I would like to begin proceedings with today. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Naganawal people, past and present. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Japan Update, now in its second year, is one of the flagship events for those of us working on Japan-related issues here at the ANU. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to bring together leading experts on Japan from within the ANU, and in fact, uh, from around the globe, to offer their insights and their analysis on some of the most important issues facing Japan today. Issues, of course, which are of great relevance to us here in Australia on multiple levels. Uh, now, of course, is a fascinating time to be observing and studying Japan. Uh, the political world has experienced some major gyrations in the past few years. Uh, there's been much discussion about an improving economy. Uh, demographically, Japan continues to move into uh, uncharted territory. And from a Northeast Asian regional perspective, the country finds itself enmeshed in uh, a complex system of uh, uh, economic and political relationships and uh, rivalries. Uh, on top of all this, of course, the Tohoku region is now in its fourth year of recovery after the earthquake and tsunami of 2011. More of the Japanese nuclear officials and technicians continue to uh, address the situation at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, so there are a great many issues to consider, and uh, our presenters and uh, panelists today will certainly be dealing with many of those issues. Um, we sincerely hope that today is uh, informative and thought-provoking for you. And just looking at our uh, lineup of uh, wonderful presenters, I'm uh, convinced that there's going to be a great deal of uh, food, uh, food for thought and uh, discussion. Uh, and related to that, um, you know, I would strongly encourage you, the audience, to become uh, actively involved in the debates and discussions that will unfold throughout the day. Um, related to that, we also see the Japan Update as a really great opportunity for people from a variety of backgrounds to come together, uh, people who are interested in Japan to come together uh, to uh, network and also to exchange ideas. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to do so in the various opportunities uh, between the presentations and panels that we have organized today. Uh, as the new director of the Japan Institute here at the ANU, I'm uh, looking forward to meeting and uh, talking with as many of you as possible today, so please do come and say hello. Okay, so uh, before we move into the first panel, just a few organizational and uh, housekeeping matters. Please let me advise that today uh, we are recording proceedings. So um, in that connection, during the uh, Q&A sessions, we'll be using microphones. So if you could wait until our mic runners reach you before you ask your question, that would be terrific. Um, also, morning tea, um, lunch, and afternoon tea will be served just outside in the foyer and downstairs as well. So please do join us for that if you can. Um, and finally, our keynote speech is uh, scheduled to begin after morning tea. Uh, our political keynote speech is scheduled to begin after morning tea at 10.30 a.m. So um, we'd be very appreciative if you could be back and seated just a little bit prior to that for the start of that um, political keynote speech. We will uh, we'll give you a sign outside uh, to come back in before that. Okay, so uh, without further ado, please uh, let me once again offer my warmest welcome to one and all. 
Uh, I hope that you will leave today updated to the very brim uh, on some of the most significant, uh, challenging, perhaps provocative, uh, and fascinating aspects of uh, contemporary Japan. All right, so um, please let me, uh, let me change hats now and uh, become the chairperson of our first panel. So I'll change my hat. Um, so indeed, uh, I think in terms of discussions about the challenges facing Japan of late, uh, what more appropriate way to begin than uh, with a panel investigating one of the greatest challenges Japan has faced, I guess, since the end of World War II. Uh, and I'm speaking, of course, uh, about the aftermath of the triple disaster of March 2011. Um, as those of you who have read uh, Professor Samuel's absolutely outstanding book on 311 will know, along with the heartbreaking human tragedy and the inspiring uh, sort of displays of resilience, the disaster also provided us with a really unique opportunity, I think, to closely observe uh, the operations, sometimes dysfunctions, uh, of various institutions and organizations in Japan at a, a time of crisis. Political leaders like uh, former Prime Minister uh, Kan Naoto found themselves under the public and media microscope for their decision making. Uh, the nuclear industry and utility companies, TEPCO in particular, came under greater scrutiny than ever before. And corporations like SoftBank, Yahoo Japan, Mitsubishi generated a great deal of uh, public goodwill through their financial and material support for uh, the post-disaster recovery effort. Now, the other important source of post-disaster response, of course, was civil society, which is the focus of our first panel this morning, which deals with Fukushima and civil society. <clears throat> now, uh, by civil society, I'm referring, or we're referring to a very broad sphere of not-for-profit activity, um, which included activities like disaster volunteering, uh, community level reconstruction activities and initiatives, and of course, contentious political mobilizations, for example, demanding a nuclear power phase out in the country. Uh, we witnessed all of these phenomena in the wake of the disaster. Uh, so uh, it was a very busy time indeed for those of us who work on civil society. Uh, needless to say, just as the disaster raised critical questions about political leadership, administrative competency, and of course nuclear safety, it also, I think, raised um, interesting questions about the nature of civil society in Japan. Uh, as I'm sure you know, opposition to nuclear power escalated after the disaster, beginning with a series of uh, Friday evening gatherings outside the Prime Minister's residence in downtown Tokyo, and peaking with a number of massive demonstrations in late 2011 and stretching into 2012. The question, of course, is what happened to or what is happening to that energy after it left the streets? Uh, moreover, what does the post-Fukushima civil society landscape tell us about the state of civil society and, I guess, democracy more generally in Japan? Uh, we have uh, three truly distinguished presenters to address some of these questions today. And so what we will do in the, uh, the first panel is um, we will uh, move through the presentations first, and uh, afterwards we have, um, I think we, have, we will have a comment from a distinguished participant who will be joining us, uh, after which we'll open the floor to uh, questions and discussions. So um, our first speaker is Professor Koichi Hasegawa, uh, who is without a doubt one of the preeminent scholars of Japanese civil society and social movements worldwide. Uh, significantly for our discussion today, he's been studying Japanese environmental and anti-nuclear activism for many, many years. Um, so he brings a really deeply informed perspective uh, and analysis to uh, the nature of civil society in the wake of Fukushima. 
Uh, Professor Hasegawa's presentation today is based on a, a very recent paper in the journal International Sociology entitled The Fukushima Nuclear Accident and Japan's Civil Society Context, Reactions and Policy Impacts, which I strongly recommend and uh, there are some copies out there for those of you who are interested in, in picking up a copy of that, I uh, strongly recommend it. Uh, so uh, without further ado, please uh, let me invite uh, Professor Hasegawa to the podium. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hasegawa. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, I'm very pleased and very honored to have a chance to present the paper today. Uh, especially uh, today, I'm the first speaker, so I have a strong pressure. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident and uh, changing, uh, Jap changing uh, civil society in Japan. Uh, I think uh, Japan's uh, civil society has three turning points, starting of the Eisei era and 1995 uh, Hansing earthquake and March 11 disaster. Uh, did you know uh, such sign in a Chinese restaurant? Uh, Chinese character Fukushima originally means happy land or beautiful area, but uh, this beautiful, happy area suddenly turned to the tragic land by the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident. And uh, even now, uh, more than 80,000 people are forced to evacuate by government order or uh, by their own will. And they can't see their way clear. Very little hope. Uh, and uh, uh, this summer, uh, 2014, we had the first summer with no nuclear power operating uh, uh, since uh, 1966. And uh, I have today three research questions. How can, I, how can we grasp the relationship between state and civil society in Japan? And after the Fukushima disaster, how was how has the anti-nuclear citizen activism changed and shifted? And how is anti-nuclear activism facing the barrier? Uh, and uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, until the end of the 1960s, uh, Japanese social movements were guided by a socialist ideals. Uh, but uh, in Heisei era, uh, 1989, uh, the Berlin Wall had fallen. Also in Japan, uh, and the new goal for Japan's social movements became the building of a liberal, vibrant civil society. Uh, 1995 uh, Kobe earthquake, thousands of people uh, from all over Japan rushed to Kobe to help the victim. This incident triggered to uh, 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 legalize the 1998 uh, non-profit organization law. So, uh, this is my uh, hypothesis. 
general relationship between state and uh, civil society. So, when the strong state is capable and can solve social problems, uh, citizens' activities are, are relatively weak and social support for such activities is relatively weak. This is a Showa and a uh, situation. And, simply speaking, when a strong state decreases in ability to solve social problems, citizens' activities are required to solve with stronger social support for such activities. This is a Heisei era situation. Uh, so, uh, these are basic assumptions uh, in Showa era. Uh, stable economic growth, and uh, under st stable political power by LDP, a centralized bureaucracy, the safest society with little crime and good public security, and state-coordinated society. Uh, but uh, how about in Heisei era? Long year recession, declining economic power called a loss to decades, unstable, and frequently changing political leader. We have 18 prime ministers in Heisei era in these uh, 12, 6 years, including uh, double counting of current prime minister Abe. Uh, and the reform for decentralization. And we are realizing uh, in the risk society. So, uh, this is a very simple contrast, uh, the Showa era and the Heisei era. Okay. Uh, so recently, uh, currently, uh, a problem is found, an uh, NPO is founded. So uh, Japanese society has 50,000 uh, NPOs. So constructing uh, a more vibrant civil society has been just on the way under the 1998 NPO law. Uh, and this is uh, my uh, analytical scheme uh, based on uh, social movement uh, theory. So I'd like to focusing on uh, cultural planning, <coughs> mobilizing resources, and uh, structure of political opportunity. So uh, in Japanese standard, uh, for long years, uh, 10, 10,000 uh, gathering is a critical standard. Uh, the anti-Japan US security treaty campaign in June 1960, at the time, 330,000 citizens gathered. This was a peak. So after then, uh, beyond 10,000 gathering, was very few. Uh, in case of nuclear energy, uh, after a Chernobyl accident, uh, April 1988, uh, 20,000 protesters gathered. And in many cases, such large uh, demonstration, I would call uh, assigned mobilization. So, like uh, 100 from teachers' union, uh, 150 from postal workers, etc. And uh, each union provided bus service, daily pay, and even lunch box. So I would like to articulate uh, these five stages. Uh, 
from uh, early stage and uh, the pre Chernobyl stage, post Chernobyl stage, the ultra high Fukushima stage, and the post Fukushima stage. Uh, and uh, uh, before the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident, Japanese government uh, policy to promote nuclear energy has been uh, too stable and too coherent. Uh, under the centralized political system, and uh, electrical utilities maintain a monopoly uh, control over the energy market, and relatively weak anti-nuclear groups, and the extremely dependent upon externally external energy supplies, strong faith in technology and using different Japanese words of atomic for commercial use and nuclear only for weapon. Uh, so uh, after the Fukushima uh, disaster, Japanese society are facing to real risk of exposing radiation. And many reaction and new activism occurred from <coughs> civil society. So, uh, very interesting, uh, from uh, mid-April, uh, such a protester uh, started to gather uh, more than uh, uh, 10,000. Uh, uh, okay. uh, and uh, June 11, uh, Shinjuku, 20,000 protesters gathered, and also other 140 places nationwide. Uh, and uh, beyond uh, many uh, expectations, such a mobilization will be uh, decreasing uh, after 2012. But in fact, especially a, a Two thousand twelve June and July, uh, especially uh, more than two hundred thousand protesters gathered. This is very tremendous number, especially in a uh, context of Japan. So uh, Simon already uh, referred uh, called uh, Kante uh, demonstration. Every uh, Friday uh, evening uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, from the uh, end of March uh, 12, 2012, uh, so many uh, people uh, gathered, and uh, especially uh, uh, June and July at the time, uh, the Northern Cabinet uh, started to uh, be opening uh, two nuclear reactors in Kansai area to meet uh, the summer peak. So, uh, this is uh, uh, the number of uh, participants of anti-nuclear uh, demos and mass rallies in Tokyo. So uh, this is a line, uh, 10,000. This 10,000 line is very critical. So I already described uh, only uh, before the Fukushima accident, only two times. Uh, more than 10,000 people gathered for anti-nuclear issues. Uh, but uh, 2012, uh, June and uh, July, uh, two times 200,000 people gathered.
Uh, and we can find a new style of activities like uh, sound demo and stressing uh, self-expressiveness. And uh, so many varieties, varieties of uh, participants. Uh, and a very interesting, uh, these are uh, new uh, participants are less organized individuals, families, and friends, uh, small tentative groups, uh, ordinary citizens, and a very low uh, political orientation, motivated by just a strong distrust, uh, anxiety, and anger for prime ministers. Uh, so, these uh, characters are sharing uh, with the uh, protest that uh, Arab Spring uh, and uh, uh, Occupy a movement uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, some are uh, one of my research colleagues uh, articulates three types of typical three uh, types of groups. Uh, first, 50s and more, men and women of leftist backgrounds, uh, they are uh, very uh, concerned about peace and Article 9 of the Constitution. Uh, Japanese baby boomers born in 1947 and 1950. So the second groups are uh, 30s and 40s female and worrying mothers. They are concerning about energy shift and renewable energy. And uh, 20s and early 30s, they are also concerning about anti-poverty and freighters issues. So some are uh, stressing uh, media activism. So don't trust uh, mainstream media. Don't accuse mainstream media. Yourself should be alternative media. You should be an alternative media reporter. Very interesting. And uh, the leader of the uh, first uh, demonstration in April uh, 2011, uh, he said, uh, revolt from ordinary people. But uh, the problem is, what are strategies, tactics, and effective political route to real, really change the government energy policy? Uh, I think uh, these are not clear. So what are strategies and tactics? Who are politi effective political partners? Yeah. Uh, some are collecting signatures and already a, uh, more than 8 million signatures were collected. But uh, they were they effective? And uh, in two elections, uh, general election 2012, and in the upper house election uh, July 2013, both uh, LDP won. So. Uh, anti-nuclear activism fail to find their effective uh, political partners. DBJ, uh, 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 Democratic Party of Japan, uh, DBJ's position was uh, very ambiguous on uh, nuclear issues. Uh, so, uh, in contrast with Japan, as you know, uh, in Germany, uh, Merkel uh, decided to shut down all 17 nuclear reactors by the end of 2012. So, in Germany, uh, triggered by the Fukushima accident, political and social consensus on nuclear energy was finally reached. 
after Romy has bottle between Puro and Kong size of the nuclear <coughs> energy debate. So I'd like to uh, contrast uh, Japanese situation and Germany. So in Japan, weak political leadership uh, and uh, centralized uh, effective uh, regulation and authority system and weak and small NGOs, no Green Party, weak voice from uh, civil society, uh, and a strong voice from economic sector, uh, Keidan Ren, and uh, cross relationship between LDP and economic sector. So, uh, after the Fukushima accident, very few policy change happened. Uh, only new law to promote renewable energy, and uh, new strict and independent regulation system started, but uh, recently LDP and pro-nuclear side uh, are currently giving strong political pressure to admit the reopening. So, uh, Japanese nuclear energy policy, we have three possibilities, uh, shutdown of nuclear reactors immediately and uh, reopening uh, the nuclear plants, uh, and uh, DPJ cabinet's uh, policy, uh, admitting 40-year operations strictly, and finally, by the end of 2030s, uh, denuclearization uh, will be processing or the opening and uh, constructing uh, new plants. This is our cabinet uh, st uh, scenarios. So, uh, conclusion. After the 3-11 uh, uh, situation, uh, we are facing real nuclear uh, risks and radiation exposure, and people got strongly angry at distrust and disappointment. And uh, civil society in Japan is changing into one uh, where anyone can easily participate in a uh, demonstration. Uh, but uh, protesters do not yet succeed to find the effective uh, political route to change the government to nuclear policy to a post-nuclear state. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hasegawa. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Shoko Yonayama. Uh, she is a sociologist based at the University of Adelaide. Uh, Dr. Yonayama has published extensively in the sociology of education, as well as in the areas of alternative agriculture and the organic movement in Japan. Uh, professionally, Dr. Yonayama has been a leading figure in building Japanese studies in Australia, apart from serving as social sciences editor on the flagship journal Japanese Studies. Dr. Yonayama was coordinator or co-coordinator of the Gateway Japan Study Tour, the uh, largest project funded by the Australian government's new, uh, new Colombo Plan project in uh, 2014. Uh, Dr. Yonayama's presentation today is based on a recent paper entitled Life World Beyond Fukushima and Minamata, which asks whether we have the language and the concepts in the social sciences to really understand uh, Minamata and Fukushima, a fascinating connection there. Um, and also ask the question about you know, whether we have the, uh, the capacity in the social sciences to prevent such uh, or the language to prevent such catastrophes happening again. Uh, this is a really wonderful paper, which I highly recommend, and actually it's available online. I think you can, you can download this one, so please do read it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming <coughs> Professor Yoni Elmer.
you, Simon, for, very, uh, for your very kind introduction. And good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure uh, and my honor to be here today as part of um, Japan Update 2014. So thank you. Um, well, lengthy and greedy title here. <laughs> uh, civil society discourses on life, soul, and nature, rethinking the social sciences for the post-Fukushima era. Uh, this is the uh, excerpt from the preface of the book 311 by Professor Richard Samuel, who is sitting right here today. Um, although, although the scale, scale may differ, the triple disaster would have caused a similar sense in each of us, researchers of Japan, in relation to our own work. My disciplinary background is sociology, and what struck me most about 311 are these words by German sociologist Ulrich Beck. He said, Japan plunged into the world risk society as a result of the nuclear accident in Fukushima. As you know very well, Beck's thesis is that world risk society characterized by such things as nuclear accident and global warming is an unfortunate byproduct of modernity and that in order to minimize the risk, it is essential to transform the system. The question is, what to change and how to change it. The world risk society occurs in what sociologists call second, late, or liquid modernity. The main characteristic of which is individualization. There, the connection between the individual and social institutions weakens. And the moral and ethical foundation of society also weakens. The question becomes, what moral and ethical foundation can protest, protect modern societies from the self-destructive tendency of modernity? As you know, Germany decided to decommission all existing nuclear plants in 10 years' time, immediately after the Fukushima nuclear accident. Underlying this decision was a report by Ethics Committee for a Safe Energy Supply, of which Ulrich Beck was also a member. The report reads, a special human duty towards nature has resulted from Christian tradition and European culture. This begs an immediate question of what might be an Asian principle of environmental ethics. When I think about the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, with these questions in mind, what puzzled me most is this. The Minamata program was studied by a group of the best and the most critical social scientists in Japan, to the extent that it established what is now called Minamata studies. My question is why, with the very best of social scientists, we couldn't prevent Fukushima. The question is not just about power and political economy, but also about epistemology. Have we not missed something really important, the key to understanding Minamata and Fukushima? This graph shows Japan's economic growth by GDP. The red line indicates the growth rate and the histogram, the size of the GDP. It shows that this phase of Japan's economic growth began with Minamata and finished with 
Fukushima. Minamata disease was officially recognized in 1956, exactly at the time the Japan's economic high growth period began. The nuclear accident of Fukushima occurred only days after China officially displaced Japan as the world's second largest economy. Minamata and Fukushima thus symbolizes the beginning and the end of Japan's economic success. Between 1956 and 2011, social science research has contributed enormously to understanding the structural problems associated with modernity. In the context of Japan, we found that even though 55 years apart, Fukushima and Minamata have many fundamental commonalities. From the perspective of political economy, the commonalities include that both were driven by relentless pursuit of profit, collusive relationships between industry, governments, bureaucracy, and the media, marginalization of critical scientists, including social scientists. Looking from a different perspective, the catastrophes of Minamata and Fukushima present cases where breakdown of connectedness occurred at many levels. There was breakdown in communities and families, in our relationship with nature, in the way food is produced and perceived, in our way of life, and it affected people's connectedness with the past and the future. What is most important is that the breakdown of connectedness occurred not only in sociological spheres, but also in biological dimensions. In the case of Minamata disease, the connectedness in the nervous system, in the brain, was severed. The recent study by the University of Calgary showed how mercury, the cause of Minamata disease, disrupt the growth of neurons in the brain, how it severs the connectedness of the nervous system itself. Radiation, on the other hand, destroys the DNA itself and severs the connectedness among cells. These are the photos of heart and other muscles of Ouchi Hiroshi-san, who died being involved in the criticality incident at Tokai Mura in 1999. Heart muscles were not affected much because heart cells do not regenerate much, but cells in other parts of his body lost connectedness and turned into a mash. If one of the characteristics of modernity is the weakening connectedness, Minamata and Fukushima epitomizes it to its extreme. They show how relentless pursuit of profit can destroy the very basis of life itself. Is it any wonder then <coughs> that words which mean connectedness emerged as a legacy of both Minamata and Fukushima? In the case of Minamata, moyai, meaning tying both together, Kizuna, meaning bonds, on the other hand, has become the legacy of the triple disaster. It is clear that people in Japan felt the need for more connectedness with society after Fukushima. This has been captured by official statistics as well. The public opinion survey conducted in 2012 by the cabinet office showed that some 80% of over 6,000 respondents indicated that after the 2011 disaster, they came to realize the importance of the connected, connectedness with society to the greater extent that they did earlier. The feeling a sense of connected, connectedness with everything else around us 
That is spirituality in the broadest sense. In this sense, the legacy of Minamata and Fukushima, namely Moyai, tying boats together, and Kizuna, meaning bones, or the civil society discourse of Minamata and Fukushima can be considered as the discourse of spirituality. I now would like to introduce Ogata Masato, a fisherman and philosopher from Minamata. He is the person who said that Moyai, tying boats together, is the legacy of Minamata. About Minamata, he reflects this way. The Minamata disease incident has left a question that cannot be dealt with as a political issue. It is the biggest and the most fundamental question, a question that cannot be transformed into a question of policies or institutions. That is the question of the soul, or more appropriately in Japanese, tamashi. He says that we need to express what soul or tamashi is more substantively, and that soul is the basis for the connectedness among people, <coughs> between humans and other creatures, and between humans and inanimate things in nature, like rivers, the sea, mountains, and so on. Now, what he's talking about here can be understood as animism. Animism is a notion that everything around us has a kami, or spirit, and animism connects us with nature. In Ogata's philosophy, life, or inochi in Japanese, equals to soul, or tamashi in Japanese, that is equals to nature. He calls this entity the life world. Animism is a topic that has gained considerable attention in anthropology recently. A new interpretation of animism is that it is a relational concept and not just an ancient belief that there are spirits in nature. It represents a new but old ways of relating to nature and everything else around us with care. Ogata's notion of the life world includes not only present day common things, present day living things, but the vast continuum of life millions of years in the past as well as in future. It refers to the totality of life in nature that developed from a common genome of which humans are just a part. Ogata says, was not the crux of the Minamata struggle a call from the spiritual world of Minamata fishermen and victims? The heart of the Minamata question lies in their call to live, live together in a world where life is lived and connected. In the field of social science, the question of spirituality <coughs> constitutes a big lacuna. This is because social science itself is a product of modernity, and secularism has been its most fundamental premise. Matters of spirituality, therefore, has been epistemologically strange in the social sciences. Animism has been treated as if it were magic, and its elimination was considered key to modernity. At the same time, the notions of nature and life have been quite limited in the social sciences so far. Is it possible for the discourse of Minamata and Fukushima to fill this lacuna and provide a new but old kind of principle of environmental ethics? So here's my conclusion. Every philosophy and every social theory is culturally and historically specific. 
while the impact of the increasing economic power of Asia is felt all over the world, no ethical framework to support its sustainable uh, development has emerged. Ogata's philosophy may provide a first step for us to start imagining a new way of perceiving everyday life for a different kind of modernity. To do this may demand an epistemological change in the social sciences. But perhaps there is nothing new in this. After all, sociology didn't exist before Durkheim established the existence of social phenomena so generous that are independent of the actions and intentions of individuals. Would it be going too far to say that recognition of the existence so generous of the life world might be the precondition for a new kind of modernity where sustainable development is possible? Thank you. very much, Dr. Yonehama. Our uh, third speaker is uh, Professor Tessa Morris Suzuki of the ANU. Of course, Professor Morris Suzuki really needs uh, no introduction, being one of the most influential scholars of East Asia and Japan working today, and uh, I must say a constant uh, source of inspiration for her colleagues, uh, like myself. Uh, in relation to Fukushima, uh, some of uh, Professor Morris Suzuki's recent work has focused on citizen radiation testing, uh, rebuilding initiatives among nuclear, uh, excuse me, around rural communities near Fukushima, and uh, a much broader um, project on the phenomenon of daily life politics in Japan. Uh, today, uh, Professor Morris Suzuki will be talking about grassroots movements in Fukushima Prefecture, but situating these within a a wider analysis of recent developments in civil society and democracy more generally in uh, Japan. Please join me in welcoming Professor Morris. Thank you very much, Simon. It's great to be here. Um, as Simon mentioned, I've um, taken the liberty of interpreting the topic of this panel um, fairly broadly. Uh, and I want to try and look at some general trends in civil society in Japan post Fukushima, um, and also maybe raise a few questions about how we understand the notion of civil society itself. Um, very soon after the 311 triple disaster, I participated with some other ANU academics in a forum at the Australian Institute of International Affairs on the implications of, for Japan of the March 2011 tsunami. And at that time, events were still unfolding and it was really very difficult to predict anything. Um, but what I tried to do being a historian was to look back at earlier disasters and think what effects such a massive disaster might produce. Um, and I could think of two possible um, developments. One, looking back to the great Kanto earthquake of 1923, um, a possible reaction, uh, as I said, then would be a defensive sense of nationalism, not in the form of the murderous xenophobia of 1923, but in the form of an intensified inward turning attitude and a heightened fear of the outside world. And another possible trend, looking back to the 1995 Kobe earthquake, could be a rise in the forms of civil society activism that flourished after that earthquake. And now, um, sort of three and a half, I suppose we are three and a half years on, looking back, I think it's possible to see both of those phenomena having occurred since March 2011, but really not in ways that I could possibly have predicted at the time. Um, and in a way, um, a rise in certain sorts of nationalism and a rise in certain sorts of civil society activism have not only occurred side by side, but have, have been intertwined in um, complicated and um, sometimes 
rather troubling ways. Much of the early literature on civil society as a phenomenon, uh, a lot of it coming from Europe, uh, took it as a given that civil society organizations were democratic and progressive in outlook. Uh, and some scholars define civil society as being democratic and progressive. But events that followed the collapse of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe uh, from the late 1980s led to the emergence of a more pessimistic view. Um, and some scholars started writing about uncivil society, so grassroots non-governmental movements that were nationalistic, anti-democratic, sometimes openly racist. And some scholars of Eastern Europe pointed out that it's actually risky to draw a very sharp line between civil and uncivil society, because certainly in the Eastern European case, sometimes you know one kind of morphed into the other. I think since 311 in Japan, we've seen the rise of a really wide spectrum of grassroots action, ranging from the diverse anti-nuclear movements uh, that Professor Hasegawa spoke about, uh, through a whole range of other really interesting developments I'll say a little bit more about, to some far-right grassroots activism that's having quite a profound um, in influence in Japanese society today. And I think it's really important to try to think about that whole range of grassroots action and try and understand how it's connected. So I want to try and make some very brief comments about that, although, of course, they're only very preliminary comments to open up discussion. Um, the recent uh, prolifer proliferation of uh, right-wing grassroots groups in Japan obviously is not directly connected to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, um, and some of these groups existed before the disaster, uh, but I think there are some indirect connections that I'd like to talk about. And in the months following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, as uh, Professor Hasegawa explained, we saw this upsurge in anti-nuclear activism in Japan. And as the scale of the disaster became apparent, um, the protest demonstrations began to attract not only a seasoned members of environmental groups, but a mass of people who'd never been engaged in political protest before. Um, and interestingly, just a very few people from the far right joined the anti-nuclear demonstrations. Uh, one of them is this person, Hasegawa Daisuke, um, who has become a quite a, a vocal anti-nuclear um, protester. Very much the exception, though, of course, uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, so this tide of anti-nuclear activism peaked, really, as we saw, um, in the middle of 2012, um, and had those really interesting characteristics of being quite carnivalesque, bringing in a lot of young people with music and arts and dance in a way that we hadn't really seen before. Um, and also, as Professor Hasegawa mentioned, there was talk even of a, um, a hydrangea revolution, uh, a jisai kakume, paralleling the jasmine revolution um, in Tunisia the year before. But this loose and largely disorganized confluence of forces lacked the cohesion to become a sustainable movement and also faced very strong opposition from sections of uh, politics, um, business, and the media. And so although majority public opinion, I believe, still remains in favor of phasing out nuclear power, and obviously a number of determined anti-nuclear groups go on protesting, the mass protest movement, I think we can say, had really collapsed by the second half of 2013. Since then, the most notable wave of non-governmental action in Japan has been the very vocal actions of a growing number of far-right groups attracting much smaller membership than, than took part in these anti-nuclear demonstrations, but still being very visible. Um, and um, their targets, as you probably know, have particularly been um, Koreans in Japan and recently the Asahi Shimbun, and I'm not gonna go into the story of the Asahi, uh, Asahi bashing phenomenon, but I hope some of you were aware of it. It's very much an important ongoing issue. Um, and these, um, uh, often internet-generated right-wing movements, I think having a serious stifling impact on free debate um, in Japan. So you see on, on the top some very kind of aggressive um, statements from far-right groups. Um, the phenomenon of grass, uh, grassroots right-wing groups obviously 
uh, is not directly a, a result of the Fukushima disaster, but I think it's indirectly connected in at least three ways. Um, I think that the expanding appeal of these groups is partly attributable to the fact that they provide an outlet for an amorphous but profound sense of social anxiety that was triggered by the 3.11 disaster and that is still there, partly, of course, because many people in Japan, very understandably, are concerned that there may be another disaster, that the, the earthquake may be you know, part of a series of seismic um, movements that may affect Japan again in the future. Um, secondly, the upsurge of the mass um, anti-nuclear movement in 2012 uh, posed um, a direct challenge to some of the far-right groups that had already emerged before um, 2011, particularly the, the <coughs> prominent one, which is called the Zaitokakai. And this group um, had a real sense of crisis, that their support base was being kind of lured away to the anti-nuclear movement. Um, and they responded becoming, by becoming very aggressive um, anti-anti-nuclear protesters, um, so you know, pro-nuclear pro um, protesters, but also, I think, by intensifying their basically xenophobic um, message. Um, I also would like to put out what I know is going to be a very controversial suggestion and one that I really can't prove at all. Um, but I do think that some um, sections of the media in Japan and some uh, politicians, particularly on the far end of the, the right-wing spectrum, did probably raise nationalist issues deliberately um, at the time when the anti-nuclear campaign was, was at its peak to distract attention away from the nuclear issue. Um, and you know, the one case that I'd like to suggest, um, open to debate, is that um, you know, in 2012, when these nuclear anti-nuclear demonstrations were very <coughs> active, uh, the then governor of Tokyo, Ishihara Shintaro, suddenly proposed that Tokyo was going to buy the Senkaku Islands. Uh, and this you know, sparked a whole furor over this issue. Um, is it cause and effect? I mean, I can't prove that, but it's a, it's a thought. Um, and I think the presence of some sort of connection, at a kind of psychological level at least, uh, between the Fukushima disaster and the rise of grassroots um, xenophobic nationalism can be seen in this recent upsurge of, of Asahi bashing, this intense campaign of hostility by the <coughs> internet right wing and section, some sections of the mainstream media against the moderately liberal Asahi newspaper, um, which is focused on two mistakes in reporting that the Asahi made about two issues. One is the comfort women issue, and the other is the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And in both cases, the Asahi made a mistake in its reporting. Um, not really, I think, the sort of mistakes that in normal cases would produce this kind of furor, but it's produced this huge reaction against um, the Asahi. And I think there's something, there's something deeper going on here, and I, you know, I'd open it to debate as to what that is. Um, so I think the, the very rapid rise and equally rapid collapse of mass level anti-nuclear protest and the subsequent increase in the salience of grassroots far right groups is a really important recent development in Japan that needs further examination. Um, but I also wanted to go on to say just a very little about a quite different sort of grassroots action that's emerged recently and is much more directly related to the Fukushima disaster. And this takes the form of a mass of small grassroots groups responding on the ground to the after effects of the nuclear disaster in ways that are not very visible and not really overtly political. Um, and again, you know, perhaps this doesn't fit in very well with our conventional image of civil society, but I think it's a really important development. Um, and you can find these grassroots um, uh, actions, community actions, all over Fukushima Prefecture and elsewhere. But I'll just talk about one that I'm particularly familiar with. It's a case study I've been studying for about uh, more than a year now. Um, this is um, a community movement based in a town called Towa, which is part of Nihonmatsu City in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, Towa is not far from parts of the exclusion zone, uh, but it was protected from the worst of the disaster by a range of hills nearby. But it was very badly affected 
because the town had already decided that it was going to move into organic agriculture and <coughs> ecotourism to try to revive its local economy. And of course, those were absolutely devastated by the effects of the Fukushima disaster. Um, but the Tonga community's response to the disaster, I think, has been really remarkable and in many ways really inspiring. Um, using their existing organic farming NPO as a hub for their activities, uh, they've developed their own schemes to um, uh, measure and map radiation in their area. Um, and they've developed um, collaborative programs with a group of academic scientists from Japan's Organic Farming Research Association uh, to explore ways to reduce the level of radiation in their crops to zero, if possible, or close to zero. Now, some of the members of this community have been very active in the anti-nuclear power movement. Um, others have not. Um, others are more cautious about at least the idea of immediately closing nuclear power stations. So there's a range of political views, there's a range of views on nuclear power within the group. But that doesn't really matter, because what they're doing on the ground is not to do with ideology, it's to do with, you know, how do we survive, how do we grow crops that we can sell and that we can eat, and how do we measure our own health and monitor our own health. Um, so in retrospect, I think that the years following the Fukushima disaster will come to be seen as an era of profound change in Japanese civil society. But because those changes are still ongoing, it's very difficult to reach any firm conclusions about them. And I think that one of the key problems that emerges from the very diverse forms of non-governmental action that I've talked about is the notion of community. Um, that um, Shoko Yoneyama uh, referred to in her paper particularly. So the disastrous impact of the Fukushima explosions and meltdowns on the surrounding area encouraged significant and inspiring efforts to rebuild affected communities from the ground up. Um, and as uh, Professor Yoneyama mentioned, you know, one of the key terms has been kizuna, bonds. And this is a very you know, ambiguous term, so it can be very much about local community bonds, but it can also have a national um, uh, element to it that in some ways ties in with more right-wing sort of rhetoric. And I thought these two images of Kizuna were interesting ones. The one on the right, very much a local environmental sort of image. The one on the left, a more national focus image. Um, so these rather random reflections on civil society in uh, post-Fukushima Japan lead not really to any clear conclusions at all, but to a series of questions that I'd like to put forward for our discussion in the session and maybe in the course of the day. Um, for example, is the recent upsurge of right-wing groups in Japan a temporary wave that's going to pass as quickly as the upsurge of mass anti-nuclear protests pass? or is it part of a longer-term trend? And how deep is its long-term impact on civil society and the public sphere in Japan going to be? Can the crucial question of the future of nuclear power in Japan be put back at the center of the public debate agenda? Because I think it's been somewhat sidelined in the past year. And can grassroots rebuilding of communities damaged by the disaster be developed into a movement that expands the power of an open and tolerant and pluralistic civil society at the national as well as the local level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa. Uh, today we're extremely fortunate to uh, have with us Mr. Murray McLean, currently chairman of the Australia-Japan Foundation, a generous supporter of today's Japan Update. Uh, Mr. McLean has a long and distinguished career in the Australian Foreign Service, and in fact, he was serving as Australian ambassador to Japan at the time of the triple disaster in 2011. Uh, Mr. McLean has kindly agreed to uh, offer some comments on his experiences and impressions of that moment. Uh, so please join me in uh, welcoming Mr. McLean. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, it's a great pleasure also f to be uh, on behalf of the Australia-Japan Foundation to ho uh, assist in hosting this event. 
which is a very valuable annual uh, one, and uh, we certainly look forward to doing that in the future. Um, Simon's uh, asked me to talk about uh, my impressions at that time. I don't want to give you some stale impressions. I wanted also, having heard the three very interesting presentations, also to offer a few comments relating to those as well. Um, clearly, on, on 3.11, it was a, a drastic situation, but it, uh, unlike, I think, anything else that uh, Japan had faced uh, in the post-war period, um, it was quite unanticipated that it would be a, uh, a, an unfolding disaster over a period of not just a few hours, as it was initially with the earthquake followed by the tsunamis, three or four big waves, um, not just the one, and then, of course, uh, the unfolding nature of the Fukushima um, disaster, which really the public in Japan was kept heavily ignorant of, I'd have to say. Um, a really shameless, it was shameful the performance of TEPCO in hiding it uh, from its own employees, let alone the government of the day. Um, uh, one can understand the need to avoid panic or causing panic but the abiding impression that um, we in Tokyo at that particular time had was nonetheless, that, um, and, and this is also, if I can co make a, a comparison with my uh, rather longer period, including through disasters like the 1976 Tangshan earthquake in Beijing, uh, that the response from the, China, the Japanese public uh, was really rather different from that that I experienced in China in the early days. Uh, and that was of a, a community of people who um, were extraordinarily um, controlled and uh, very calm in the sense that uh, here was this huge disaster. Uh, nobody really knew what the implications of it were. And the resilience, I think, that uh, one saw and the patience that one experienced of people who walked sometimes 12 hours back to their homes many long kilometres away um, or stood in queues for ever dwindling supplies of absolutely basic necessities like water and milk um, was something that frankly you don't see in China. It would have been all hell breaking loose and uh, going for it. So that was an impression that uh, I think was quite uh, abiding for me and one that impressed me very deeply about how the Japanese as a nation were going to cope with this disaster. Um, the fact that some of the communities in Fukushima were just completely um, uh, destroyed effectively in terms of their having to evacuate without really any notice um, was one of the reasons why the Australia Japan Foundation um, decided to devote approximately 20 to 25 percent of its budget to helping the recovery of the communities not only in Fukushima but also in Minami Sanriku and on the coastal areas where the Australian search and rescue team had gone in the immediate days following the disaster. And we continue to do that now for, uh, for four years after the disaster. Um, we have, we invite grants, as you would be aware, from many uh, associations, including this university. Um, and uh, we've, in our small way, I think, helped to rekindle the community spirit that uh, I think is very important and is an essential part of the fabric of Japan's society in these areas. The dislocated communities of uh, um, around Itate, which uh, was 45 kilometres from Fukushima, uh, but by a freak of <coughs> atmospheric uh, and weather conditions, received a huge dump of radiation on it, um, raising the levels of radiation there some hundred times what they should have been, um, were uh, one of the reasons why the State of Japan Foundation decided to support uh, in several ways 
giving playground equipment to uh, the children uh, of a kindergarten um, who were um, of the, of the displaced families and also uh, to uh, um, set up a mobile library service for the communities. So there are some of the things we did. I um, would also just like thirdly to comment on something that hasn't really come out but has been implicit in the comments of the three speakers today, and that is um, that clearly there's a huge upsurge of worry and concern amongst a lot of the population in Japan about the implications of having nuclear energy as part of the energy mix. And as you'd be all aware, uh, at the time of the Fukushima disaster, it was something like 28% of the energy mix. It's now zero. And that is, of course, not without its impact uh, on, the Jap on Jap Japan's economy. In fact, it's, got, it's one of the biggest factors that is going to potentially um, uh, impact uh, and is impacting, I guess, on the ability of the Japanese economy to pull out of the um, morass that it has been in over the last couple of decades. Um, the price of imported uh, fuels to provide the energy that the Japanese industry and community needs is clearly one that um, uh, hits the budget very hard. And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons, I, I suppose, why the Abe administration is, as it were, committed to restoring at least some part of the nuclear energy um, uh, contribution to the uh, energy mix. Um, I'm just commenting on this. I'm not making a value judgment one, or one way or the other. But while there's more than 50%, I think, of the population who is anti-nuclear, it doesn't translate into 50% voting against the Abe uh, or the LDP. So it's not, as it were, uh, an issue that is necessarily going to determine uh, how the government works. And I'd also comment that a lot of the a lot of the demonstrations in 2012 and 2013 were also, I suspect, uh, stirred by a general community disappointment with the Democratic Party not being able to deliver. Uh, as well as it might have been able to, or the hoped people people hoped it would have been able to deliver um, uh, following the nuclear disaster, disaster and the reconstruction effort. Um, it was uh, really very difficult for any government to have approached that with, with uh, and to have succeeded. But they unfortunately were the ones in government at the time it happened, and naturally got the backlash a lot from it. So I think a lot of those demonstrations were not only about anti-nuclear sentiment, but also probably about the administration's perceived failure at the time to cope with it all. Anyway, I think there's a few comments. Thank you very much, Mr. McLean. Uh, so can I invite our speakers to... Uh, okay, so uh, please let me open up the floor to uh, questions and uh, comments. from ANU. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the very interesting and uh, informative and update uh, discussion on this uh, one of the important issues. My, uh, my question is just to uh, Professor Hana Agawasa. And uh, your uh, key hypothesis of your speech is that the state, when state is strong and uh, civil society is awake, when the state is awakened and the civil society are rising. So uh, you, you seem to suggest that there's uh, some kind of a uh, substitute relationship. And uh, I would argue that hope actually lies at, uh, at uh, you know, the complements. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the society, whether the rising civil society mm -hmm. in responding to the crisis mm -hmm. can, can, can make the, uh, you know, the state be stronger mm -hmm. in confronting those challenges and the crisis, rather than being further weakened mm -hmm. by the rising one. So that, that also related to my second question. You, uh, when you review the, uh, mm -hmm. the regulations 
in comparison between Japan and Germany. Mm -hmm. I was noticed that is, uh, the J in Japan is centralized but ineffective, mm -hmm. but in Germany it's a decentralized yeah. regulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in terms of regulation, probably centralized may be more effective in terms of enforcement. So uh, the, the reason why the Japan's uh, the system become ineffective, perhaps that's due to something else. So that's my second question. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, questions for me. Uh, yeah. uh, the relationship between a state and a civil society. Yeah. How uh, can I uh, think about uh, both relationship? Uh, for example, uh, uh, in the U.S., relatively weak. Uh, uh, government and strong civil society. I'm not sure here <laughs> in Australia, <laughs> maybe strong uh, civil society. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, uh, in Japanese context, uh, balancing between uh, the power of uh, central government and the power of civil society. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, traditional, or uh, maybe in South Korea, and maybe in mainland China and in Taiwan, uh, in East Asian context, we are facing a strong uh, state and relatively weak civil society, and uh, getting more uh, strong civil society will uh, include uh, more uh, democratic uh, society. This is uh, one of my uh, basic uh, hypotheses. And especially in Heisei era, uh, Japan has lots of social problems to, uh, to be uh, tackling. Uh, for example, uh, very low fertility rate, and a uh, lot of uh, uh, risk society situation described uh, uh, Professor Yoneyama today. Yeah. So uh, the uh, best, uh, uh, the most priority things uh, to do in Japanese society is uh, how we should uh, promote vibrant uh, voluntary uh, civil society. Yeah, this is my basic hypothesis. And uh, uh, second, your question. Uh, sorry, I'm not clear your point. My, my point is that you uh, when you review the uh, the regulation, the uh, the slice we're seeing in Japan is a centralized system, but oh, it's yeah. ineffective. Mm. In Germany, it's a decentralized yeah, yeah, system. Yeah. But mm -hmm. of course, it might be uh, effective. Mm -hmm. So, what is the reason for that? What is the cause it's from? Oh, yeah. It was very uh, historical uh, because uh, uh, very interesting. In even Edo era uh, and uh, pre Edo era, Japan has very uh, centralized system. Uh, uh, like uh, Kyoto, uh, do you know the word uh, nobori, kudari? Yeah. Uh, in railway, uh, every railway station go to Tokyo called nobori. And uh, pretty, uh, in pretty modern era, go to Kyoto called nobori. I cannot find any society which have such a uh, nobody could a uh, word. <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, so uh, Japan has very uh, centralized system because based on very homogeneous society, I think.
Uh, we have one here. Carol Lawson from Nagoya University. My question is for Tessa Morris Suzuki, and thank you for three fascinating presentations. Can you fit the apparent um, subversion or misdirection of the Japanese population away from deep concern over nuclear power into Roger Goodman's narrative of crisis, social panic, apparent government intervention followed by mollification? Thank you. Yes, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that particular framework, but I think that it does probably fit very well. Um, um, I think it's, it's a complicated issue because I think the, the sense of social anxiety in Japan at the moment is a really complex one. So it is partly directly about nuclear power, it's partly about the fact that we still really don't know what the human and environmental effects of the Fukushima disaster are going to be. Uh, but of course it's also more broadly about the natural disaster issue. Um, but I do think that um, there have been some deliberate attempts at the political level, and you know, meaning not only politicians but also sections of the media and so on, to try to um, yeah, channel that anxiety in directions that um, will make it manageable from the point of view, from the political point of view. Thank you. Yes, we have a question down the front here. Thank you, uh, Nobu Akiyama from Hitotsubashi University. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, uh, three presentations. I have a, a sort of a bit different view on the, the worries and the radiation effect. Um, I think it's a bit too uh, much if I, we say that society, Japanese society as a whole, are uh, concerned about radiation. I think the uh, you know, radiation impact uh, may give some sort of different uh, in, impacts on the, the different parts of society. So, uh, you know, in even within civil society, there are kind of a discourse whether we should help Fukushima by consuming the products from Fukushima or we shouldn't really eat the, anything from Fukushima. And uh, so, I think that kind of social divide is also the facts of the life. And secondly. Um, uh, in Fukushima, the more uh, a serious uh, matter is that Fukushima people have a sense that, that they are more sort of uh, anguished about uh, its, how do, you, how do you call it, kyohan kanke, or uh, I say complicity mm -hmm. with uh, the, the Tokyo Denok Tepco and uh, the government in creating myths of safety. <coughs> I mean, the, before the accident, uh, you know, the TEPCO and the government said that the nuclear power plants are, are really safe. But uh, in fact, this discourse was partly uh, created by the, this kind of relationship between local people who really want to have some economic, uh, you know, uh, the nuclear power plants for their economic reasons. And they tried to close eyes. And they actually partly asked the government and the TEPCO to say not much about the risks. So after the crisis, and uh, I think t the Fukushima people are so much uh, kind of a, you know, feel, uh, they sense so bad about what they have done before Fukushima. So I think that is also something that we have to think about as a kind of a part of civil society, uh, you know, the, the discourse. And thirdly, on the question of Asahi, uh, it's not about, uh, the, it, I don't think it should be uh, grabs in the conte context of uh, anti-nuclear, pro-nuclear, but it's more about uh, anti-authoritative discourse pr provided by the establishment. And of course, the, uh, the Asahi bashing people are from, uh, mostly from right wing, and uh, I don't think that's really appropriate way for them to do it. In particular, they are also part of media, which committed this kind of a wrong. Uh, and, uh, appropriate, uh, you know, the coverage on a couple of things, but uh, mostly uh, Asahi 
uh, is seen as a kind of a, a symbolic of the authoritative uh, uh, way of, uh, you know, um, authority of creating public opinion in Japan, and the many people are not so happy with that situation. That's why, you know, when they found the uh, the mistakes by Asahi, then uh, you know people tried to bash and. Uh, uh, so that's why the uh, the uh, shukanshi, uh, shukan bunshun, uh, weekly magazines, are sort of uh, very much uh, leading this kind of uh, the campaign against Asahi. <coughs> Any comments from our panel? Just if, if I could just quickly respond. Yes, um, I mean I think you've, the first point about that. Um, sense of guilt, in a way, is a really powerful one. And it's so sad but that um, many people in Fukushima accepted the establishment of the nuclear power plant because they were desperate for jobs and, and they were not very well informed about the risks. They were not at all well informed about the risks. Um, and then on top of that, with, for example, the community that I'm looking at, they then face the problem of when they try to sell their goods in other parts of Japan, sometimes they're almost treated as though they're aggressors or wrongdoers because they're trying to sell goods from Fukushima to other people. So I think this, this is a really, really sad and difficult problem that, uh, that people in Fukushima face and they, they need sort of understanding and support to, to deal with that. Um, and on us, he, yes, I, mean, I agree with you, it is certainly an anti-authoritarian issue in a way, but it's interesting, I mean, we get this in other places, that it always tends to be the authority or the establishment or the elite on the left side that gets, the <laughs> relatively left side, that gets the bashing. So a lot of the bashing is being done by relatively large mainstream, equally elite newspapers that are on the other side. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to add, uh, add uh, my opinion question uh, from uh, Professor uh, uh, In many uh, opinion survey uh, showed uh, after Fukushima uh, nuclear accident uh, many people uh, tend to show their uh, distrust to uh, mainstream uh, broadcasting and uh, major newspapers. Uh, so in case of uh, anti-Asahi campaign, <laughs> it's uh, extreme, but uh, it's uh, one of uh, the uh, distrust uh, of ordinary citizens. Yeah. Uh, many people support it from uh, extra right-wing people. But uh, in fact, uh, general citizens have some kind of uh, distrust for uh, mainstream uh, Japanese newspapers. It's a one of uh, example in case of Asahi. Just quickly. Um, the complicit relationship between TEPCO and government, I think I have no problem with that, but I think it's very difficult to say uh, anything about Fukushima people as a kind of unit, a whole, because the, the nature of the issue, I think, is the, uh, the disconnectedness among the people in, in Fukushima itself. So somehow benefited enormously from TEPCO, but others didn't. Some received uh, you know, compensation, others didn't. Some have children, young children, others don't. You know, even within the family, there is a dispute. There can be a dispute between whether the vegetable grown by the grandpa should be eaten by the you know, grandson or something like that. So I think it's, when we talk about people in Fukushima, we have to be very careful to understand this divisiveness within the community itself. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, you're begging me. Okay. <laughs> Is it a quick question? A very quick one, maybe. Okay. One, maybe you have time for one more quick question right here. Right here in the middle. <coughs> um, thanks, as again, for the lectures. I have one question. Did the idea of the German government to close down the nuclear facilities has any influence on the first anti-nuclear movement and on the government in Japan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what kind? Um, Germany, no, 
、うん、あのニュークレアパワーに詰めるという、うん、あのあれですね、うん、ディシジョンは日本のニュークレア政策に影響を及ぼしていくと思います。うんうんうんうん、okay。Uh, I think uh, unfortunately,、uh, Germany's uh, decision uh, uh, by、uh, Chancellor Merkel、uh, right after Fukushima、uh, accident、uh, in 2011,、uh, this uh, decision uh, did not、uh, affect the、uh, Japanese government.、Uh, Democratic Party of Japan and uh, following uh, recent LDP、uh, and Kome cabinet. Because the、uh, uh, government said、uh, Japan is an island. So we don't have uh, uh, parking uh, electricity uh, uh, like uh, Germany. Germany has、uh, French and surrounding area. Can Produce uh, can uh, provide uh, electricity.、Yeah. Th this is a, one of uh, uh, physical d i f f i c u l t y in case of Japan. Okay, okay so、uh, it's time now for a break for、uh, morning tea.、Um, I would like to once again thank our panelists and also our, our commentator,、uh, Mr. Murray McLean.、Uh, please join me in a short.